thank the meeting uh, organisers for the wonderful opportunity to actually share some thoughts. Um, as part of these meetings, we need to share our conflicts of interest, and I just show this to show that I'm an equal opportunist and will work with many people. This is a partial list of the novel treatments for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. I'm going to focus on the ones that have advanced to late-stage development based on some activity um, and encouraging data, and I think these have a reasonable shot of actually getting to the point of being approved by the regulatory agents based on the activity and the side effect profile. PR3 kinase AKT inhibition, PARP inhibitors, and lutetium PSMA as the theranostic. Not discussed, but just to not ignore the novel AR inhibitors going after the androgen receptor with androgen receptor degraders and terminal domain inhibitors, epigenetic modulators such as EZH2, LSD1, bromodenamain inhibitors, CDK46 inhibitors as has been advanced in breast cancer, and as David alluded to, PDL1 P and PD1 and CTLA4 inhibition. This slide is to just emphasize the vast array of mutations that can occur in castration-resistant prostate cancer, and people would like to say that some of these are actionable, meaning that we can identify a therapy that would pair with them. At the top is the AR pathway, and we can see that's mutated or upregulated in many patients with castration-resistant disease in this cohort of patients from the Stand Up to Cancer Prostate Cancer Foundation effort. So, but below that you see P10 loss and then activation of the PI3 kinase pathway in the second red block, um, box there. And that can be altered by genomic loss of P10, deletion of P10, microdeletion rearrangements, and then also non-genomic loss of P10 with epigenetic silencing by methylation, mRNA, and pseudogene. So P10 loss, the break on the PR3 kinase AKT pathway, can happen in a number of different ways, as well as genomic aberrations of upstream of P10 with PIK3CA, PIK3CB, PIK3R, the receptor, and AKT1. And below that, I'm just highlighting the number of potential DNA damage repair uh, pathways that have been actively investigated, both in terms of their frequency, be it germline, somatic, pre-hormonal therapy, post-hormonal th therapy, monoallelic, and bioallelic, a very complicated conversation, but I'll show where we stand in this slide set. First of all, we have been going after the PI3 kinase mTOR P AKT pathway for quite a while, and this is just a busy slide just showing there's been a lot of busyness around here, and the red X is the most important aspect of this slide, is that we have not been able to matriculate any of the AR inhibitions plus or minus mTOR inhibitor plus or minus PI3 kinase inhibitor, although much effort has gone into this very, very what is thought to be a high yield target. So it's been a rocky path. Here, however, I think is the most promising data set. So this is a study of abiraterone in patients who've had docetaxel for castration-resistant prostate cancer. It's published, and it shows that patients with P10 loss, and most of this was in their pre-hormonal therapy diagnostic trust biopsy P10 loss, who got abiraterone with an AKT inhibitor, had a markedly improved time to radiographic progression as evidenced by the blue curve here. And this was whether it was a low dose or a higher dose of the AKT inhibitor called ipatisertib. On the right, you can clearly see that there was no evidence of benefit in using an AKT inhibitor when the break was present in these patients in their archived material called the P10. So this is advanced to a large randomized phase three study. The one difference is that this is in the first line setting, pre docetaxel um, so, and their accrual can be completed. What we do know is that sometimes studies that change from their phase two to their phase three do not turn out to be positive, but we hope to get data on this in sometime next year. Here's another study that I was actively involved in. It was a study of an AK, sorry, um, enzalutamide post abiraterone in the castration resistance setting, where the response rate and the duration of benefit goes down when you're using this hormone switch approach. So this again is enzalutamide post abiraterone. And what's been documented is that these hormonal therapies are less likely to work if you have detectable circulating ARV7, the uh, variant of the antigen receptor, which is telling us that it, the gene and the AR mechanism is very mixed up when we're starting to see this ARV7 in the circulating tissue, in the circulating bloodstream, on, coming from the uh, mutated cancers. On the left are the patients who had enzalutamide with a PI3 kinase 
mTOR DNA PK inhibitor, and you can see a vast improvement in the time to radiographic progression with this multi-targeted agent of five months to 13 months. On the right, you see that when the AR was supermutated, there was no actual benefit with adding this drug to it. Unfortunately, because of some of the uncertainty about this drug um, and it not being a clear target on the P10 pathway, et cetera, uh, it, the drug has been out last month by Lilly, but actually, like the Wright brothers, you don't get it right on the first time when you're trying to go up, uh, invent um, flight. Here we actually, by humans I should say, um, blocking the AR when AR still is active um, seems to be more effective. So you can augment AR activity if the AR pathway is active, and that's what I think we see on the left, but it's actually very difficult when the AR pathway is super mutated and your drug is not going to work. So enhancing activity, not overcoming mutation, um, I think is the key thing here. Now moving on to the other very promising pathway. So we've learnt a lot about the DNA damage repair, especially um, PARP and, and the role of PARP inhibition in patients who have DNA repair defects. And this is very briefly. Um, here we see the top left is that there's a, clink, a chink in the DNA, a single strand break. PARP normally comes into that and helps with, on the right hand side of that figure, repair. And the DNA gets repaired and you have DNA um, fidelity and replication. On the right, however, if you inhibit that PARP inhibition, you actually get DNA double, double strand breaks and the cancer cells often die. That's much more common if you've lost another DNA repair mechanism. And here we actually see with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, there's a homologous recombination. So you're just piling up the number of DNA breaks with PARP inhibition and the BRCA defect, and you actually get the cancer cells to die How, with PARP inhibition, as evidenced by the bottom part of this figure. Now, there are a number of these drugs that are out there and they do vary, and they do vary in their degree of PARP inhibition as evidenced by uh, PARP trapping. And the drugs are Olaparib, Viliparib, Tolazoparib, Niraparib, and Urocaparib. So it's the Ibology, and the number of drugs have been evaluated. Now the first question is how often are these DNA damage repair present? What we know is they increase from the primary tissue pre-ADT to the castration resistant disease. We know you can get monoallelic and bioallelic loss, which may have different dependency on the PARP inhibition. And we also know that um, there can be a germline variation in patients who have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 variant of the, in their genome at the germline level, and then you can acquire it somatically. So this figure is just showing numbers of attempts to actually characterize the number of these variations of DNA damage repair genes. One is again the left from the germline level, as published by the Stand Up to Cancer team, led by Colin Pritchard, first authored by him, and on the right is actually the somatic variations showing any type of DNA um, abnormality is about 10% of the primary and about 20% in the castration resistant. Now the question is, how actionable are these? So the first shot across the bow was this investigator sponsored trial by uh, the Royal Marsden team, and as you can see here, there's variations variable mutations, BRCA2, ATM, FANK A, at variable degrees of frequency. Basically, once you get beyond BRCA2, it gets to be quite infrequent. And what you can see is if you were biomarker positive, namely you had one of those variations, blue curve, you had a much longer radiographic progression-free survival if you got a PARP inhibitor, whereas if you didn't have one of these mutations in these DNA damage, red curve, you didn't have a reasonable radiographic progression-free survival. And here is all the, a number of three studies that actually have passed through and reported already, and you can see the PSA decline 50 rate, the overall response rate was about 50% in all three studies with these different PARP inhibitors. But the response rates go down, in, but still something maybe in the ATM CDK12 patients. And then you see the side effect profile there is actually some degree of cytotoxic side effect with these drugs with some anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, fatigue. So they're no free lunch. And this is what was just presented at ESMO. Um, this is Olaparib in a cohort with BRCA mutation or ATM or BRAC cohort B without the mutations. And basically uh, it was Olaparib 300 twice a day in both cohorts versus physician choice, of which was mostly a hormonal therapy. And what you can see is the time to radiographic progression was 
vastly improved with a hazard ratio of 0.34, so a 67% delay in the time to progression and also a, a significant improvement in overall survival, 37% improvement in overall survival in those who have the really true DNA mutations that are sensitive to the PARP inhibitor. BRCA1 and 2 are driving this. So now let's move on to the radioligand therapy for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. David described the radium on the left in great detail, and on the right I'm talking about lutetium PSMA, which differs by being a beta particle. It targets the PSMA as opposed to radium, and it's expressed on bo both soft tissue and bone metastases, and has some variable characteristics, a longer uh, destruction range, as they point out here. I see you've t heard a lot about PSMA PET imaging, and they're the two images on the left, but on the right is the Lutetium PSMA with the 617, which is the most advanced radiotherapeutic as I understand it. And here is the extreme responder that actually ignited a lot of the excitement. Basically, this is a patient with the imaging showing vast uptake in the disease with, on the left in figure A, and then the patient is given two doses of the targeted radioligand, and you can see on the right that this, uh, the imaging of the cancer with far less black cells, black blobs, showed that the cancer had regressed by PSMA PET radiographic imaging and the PSA declined. Very encouraging. I just want to point out there are two, one, probably the most informative prospective study is a study that was done by the Peter McCallum team and many people contributed to this. They basically had patients who had high PSMA expression, four cycles of the drug, 30 patients, most of the patients were post-chemo and post-hormonal, so second and third line CRPC. And basically, they were very careful to exclude patients who had PSMA PET negative disease or PSMA PET positive and FDG that was not concordant, and they selected the right patients, I think, for the study. They actually had a substantial PFS of 7.6 months in these patients, and as you can see, some substantial and prolonged responses in some patients. This has led to the Australian study, which is 200 patients of lutetium PSMA versus cabazitaxel in the selected patient population. And then there's the industry-sponsored study, which is completed accrual as well, and it's patients with um, getting less selection, late-stage disease, and they get a background of uh, hormonal therapy or best supportive care plus the lutetium PSMA or just best supportive care or standard of care which is most oftentimes a set, switch to a hormonal therapy in this setting. And this basically has read out as recruit, and we hope to read out for both studies, one comparing with cabazitaxel and one comparing with less than um, active therapy, I would say. And with that, I would like to say, conclude. Clearly, we have a greater understanding of prostate cancer biology and new therapeutic options have emerged. Agents with monotherapy activity that have a reasonable chance of becoming standard of care are becoming to us. PARP inhibitors, lutetium, PSMA, AKT inhibition with abiraterone, and then many other opportunities are coming forward. Agents with monotherapy activity now to be combined with rational combinations, many new target opportunities. And I'm going to ask a question. Can we avoid, minimise futile duplication? How many PARP inhibitors, PD-1 inhibitor trials do we need? Are we over-investigating some areas and losing opportunities in more promising areas? I thank you for your attention.